the river rises in the mountains of Guatemala, home to the Quiche Indians. Quiche is one of the many Mayan languages. It has its own grammar and is still widely spoken and written today. While Spanish is the official language, Quiche is spoken every day by over two million people in Guatemala, who are immensely proud of their Mayan origins. These high mountain plateau are known as the kitchen garden of Guatemala. Agriculture thrives here thanks to the volcanic soil, which is particularly fertile. The town of Chichicastenango, at an altitude of 2,000 meters, is famous for its market. It has long been one of the most important trade centers of the whole Mayan region. Twice a week, the narrow streets are filled with Indian farmers who come to sell their produce. The region has hung on to its old customs. Men still wear traditional garb, and the women weave cloth and embroider designs which symbolize the Mayan universe. When the Spanish came here in the 16th century, they brutally imposed the Catholic religion, destroying Mayan temples to build their churches. Four hundred years later, Catholicism is still not universal, and the Quiche Indians often turn to their ancient Mayan beliefs. Shamanic rituals combine religion and medicine. Offerings are made, and copal resin is burnt to draw out the illness, which is said to evaporate in the smoke. People come from far and wide to seek healing and protection from spells. This woman has traveled with her shaman from El Salvador to get help for her sister. Leaving the high plateau of Guatemala behind, we descend the Usumacinta River to the great tropical forests of Petén. Sayache has the feel of a gold rush town. The mist hanging in the air is actually smoke from deforestation fires. Don Pedro lives in Sayache. He's been plying the river for 50 years and has witnessed the profound changes brought about in the forest. Before there was forest, it was covered in forest from here to the other side, as far as you can see, to the end of this bend in the river. All of these meadows used to be covered in forest. About 15 years ago, people started to make fields to grow crops. As usual, rich people have come and bought the poor people's land to raise cattle. They've cut down the rest of the forest, and now they own the whole area you can see here. With my experience of the forest, I can say it will not grow back. It will never grow back. Never, never. It's a crime against humanity. The forest's exceptional natural resources and its role in combating the greenhouse effect should have prompted effective action to stop this destruction. In recent years, thousands of acres of forest on the banks of the Usumacinta have gone up in smoke. We can only hope that the race for profit and the ever-increasing appetite of our consumer society do not one day completely destroy these green lungs of our planet. Of course, felling the trees also robs the varied animal population of its natural habitat. Certain species in the region are already under threat of extinction, such as the iguana. Juan has set up a project to bring the reptiles back into the forest. For our work to succeed, we need to take the eggs. You usually find them in the sandbanks along the river. During the laying season in March and April, Juan and his team collect about a thousand eggs and place them in an artificial incubator, giving them a better chance of hatching. Once released into the forest, 60% of the baby iguanas will reach adulthood. It's an effective program. In the wild, just under 7% of iguanas will live to reach one year old.
We continue our journey down the Usumacinta River. Mayan traders plied these same waters 1,000 years ago. And they took a whole year to travel the length of the river to where it joins the ocean. They went from city to city aboard large canoes powered by 40 oarsmen. Signs of their presence on the river are still clearly visible. Altar de Sacrificios was a regular port of call for the tradesmen and the site was also used by the Mayas for human sacrifice. To this day, the signs engraved on the rocks have never been deciphered. At the mouth of one of the Usumacinta's tributaries, the tradesmen carved drawings into the rocks. Some historians say this was a resting place for the boatmen, who may have carved images of the cities which they came from. The carvings represent animals and large pyramids, like those found at Tikal. Tikal is not on the banks of the Usumacinta. To reach the city, the tradesmen would have ventured into the forest on foot. Tikal is home to some of the greatest Mayan temples. The Mayan civilization, which arose 3,000 years ago, lasted six times longer than the Roman Empire. A culture of great warriors, architects, artists, and scientists. It disappeared a thousand years ago. Archaeologists do not always agree on the causes of the decline, which may have been due to war, ecological disaster, or famine, or a combination of these factors. The death of the Mayan civilization remains a mystery. The Usumacinta River forms in places a natural frontier between Guatemala and Mexico. This part of the forest on the Mexican side is home to the Lacandon people. At the start of the 20th century, almost nothing was known about the Lacandon. The small population lived discreetly in inaccessible parts of the forest. As a result, they were never colonized or converted to Christianity. Their religion derives directly from the ancient Mayan tradition. Dressed in white tunics and wearing their hair long, they have long been considered as the Maya's true descendants. The Mexican government has given them a special status. In exchange for the precious timber of their forests, they have been given roads and access to electricity and television. They are the only ethnic group allowed to sell their handicrafts at Mayan tourist sites. It's hardly a fair exchange. The value of the timber is out of all proportion to what the Lacandon receive. These legendary and once feared people of the tropical forest have fallen prey to the outside world. Now a tourist attraction, the Lacandon tried to earn a living by taking groups of visitors on trips to discover their true treasure, the Selva Lacandana. Unspoilt nature in all its glory. This region is home to 20% of Mexico's plant and animal species. Birds, butterflies, insects, and endangered species such as the scarlet macaw and the jaguar, the sacred animal of the Maya. Our journey takes us down to the mouth of the Usumacinta River, an immense wetland delta in the Mexican state of Tabasco. The biosphere reserve of the Pantanos de Centla covers 750,000 acres. Here, the Usumacinta divides into a multitude of smaller watercourses. The water is slightly salty as the ocean is not far away. But this natural paradise is under threat from oil exploration. On the riverbank, we find all sorts of waste products from the drilling process, and we can smell the oil. That's why Hugo, who campaigns to protect these wetlands, says the Pantanos de Centla are not really a nature reserve, more like an oil reserve. There are various drilling platforms throughout this area, which the Mexican oil companies want to exploit for their gas reserves. 
By drilling deeper, they are causing more damage. The main problem is that waste products from the core sampling process are discharged directly into the water. The groundwater is seriously polluted by these waste products, which contain large quantities of salt and heavy metals, lead and vanadium. They know it's happening, but they say nothing. They don't keep us informed. Our journey is almost at an end. Amidst the mangrove swamps, the Usumacinta finally meets the salt waters of the Gulf of Mexico. For the Mayas, the Usumacinta was sacred. Today, their descendants hold the river's future in their hands. Whether Quiche, Lacandon, or from other ethnic groups, their lives remain closely bound to these waters.